from wherever in the world you may be joining us. Thank you for joining us here tonight for Tustanden. My name is Kopano Tuyana Maruja, and I am here at the Kunsten Centrum Voret, working as a guest dramaturg and curator. Tustanden is a series of talks where we go into discussion around the themes and issues that are keeping us up at night. Tustanden is a partnership between Kunsten Centrum Voret, Victoria Deluxe, Masereel Fonts, ACV Gent Eklo, Hart Boven Hart Gent, and Graffiti Vezetwe. And in this edition of Tustanden, we take inspiration from the following quote from the essay of Eric Halthaus The climate crisis, crisis is racist, the answer is anti racism. Climate change is racist because the system that caused it is racist. No, 
Rainstorms don't care about skin color, but worsening weather worldwide aggravates the divisions in society that already exist because it hits people of color living in poverty the hardest. Simply put, the reason the world hasn't been fighting climate change as hard as it should is because powerful people don't want to stop exploiting people of color. The urgency of climate change is also an urgency for racial justice. This particular edition of Tustanden forms part of our online program, No Time to Waste, an online program launching our sustainability action plan. Our globalized and interconnected way of life spread a pandemic across the planet in 2020. The resulting crisis has and continues to have an enormous impact on our way of life. But that crisis also illustrates a larger systemic problem. We inhabit our planet in a colonial way, with a strategy of expansion, depletion, and exploitation. It is high time to do something about that, and the rate wants to contribute. We do this with an ambitious sustainable action plan, which we would like to present to you with this online program, No Time to Waste. To find out more about this program and to read our sustainability action plan, you can, you can go to our website at vor8.be. In tonight's conversation, we will be going into discussion with three rigorous and inspiring artists whose practices lie at the intersection of environmental justice and social justice from a multitude of perspectives. They are Amanda Piña, Maria Lucia Cruz Correa, and Grace Ndritu. In this talk, it will take place in three parts. Firstly, each speaker will present their practice in their own words in connection to tonight's theme. Secondly, we will enter into a panel discussion. And thirdly, lastly, we will leave time at the end to receive questions from viewers. So please feel free to submit these questions into the chat function that you will find either on Vimeo or on Facebook. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Amanda Piña. Amanda Piña is a Mexican, Chilean, Austrian ar artist and cultural worker living in Vienna and Mexico City. In her work, she is concerned with the decolonization of art with an emphasis on the political and social power of movement. Her works are contemporary rituals to temporarily dismantle the ideological dividing lines between modern and traditional humans, animals, and plants, and nature and culture. Amanda Piña wants to create art that goes beyond just making a product and therefore develops new frameworks to create sensual experiences. Currently, she is working on a long-term project, Endangered Human Movements, dedicated to movements and cultural practices that have already disappeared or are in danger of extinction. Four research volumes within the framework of this project have already been realized, including various performances, installations, videos, publications, workshops, and lectures. Over to you, Amanda. How are you doing tonight? Thank you very much, Cubano. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm fine. I am with jet lag, but I'm happy to be here with you and very honored for this uh, very long presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and where uh, are you joining us from? Yeah. Sorry? Where are you joining us from? I am in Vienna since two days, so I am kind of adapting to the cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me. and. Yeah, if uh, I should maybe explain a bit where I am at, at the moment and why this call is very relevant uh, for me and what I say, yes, I want to contribute. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, as you said, I am doing this research project and actually, uh, and we can go to the slides too, right? I come from a mountain uh in chile i grew up in that mountain uh it is a mountain in the andes of chile central andes i don't know if you guys are watching it because i cannot see it so yes <laughs> yes we see it great um, and that mountain uh, is uh, is a site of extraction we have uh, three different projects, which are extractivist projects. Uh, one, in, in one is involved a company called Anglo American. It is a copper, gold, and silver extraction. There is in the other side an uh, electric uh, project made by ISGENER, which is Strabag, which is an Austrian company. 
So in the context of Chile, as an extractivist country, we could not develop um, something like an industry. It was very clear that that was not the way our history was going to be shaped by the powers that be in the 70s, 80s. Uh, I live, and my mother still lives in, under this mountain. And I've been doing different projects related with dance, indigenous people. I'm very interested in other forms of other ontologies, other, other forms of understanding art, life, and also other forms of understanding uh, our position in the world and, and, and our being together, yeah, mm -hmm. or world being, the world we create through our action. Mm -hmm. uh, but this time, and this is the fifth volume of my research, uh, it took me very personal because I wanted to do something about this particular mountain and about mountains in general. And through the project, I learned uh, something that uh, I, I'm here to share. Uh, I started working with an anthropologist from Mexico who works uh, with a dance, two dances of the Northern Highlands of Puebla. So my, my topic has been always researching on dances and understanding what dances can sort of teach me. Like I research on dances, but dances also open up a world of knowledge and a world of, uh, of understanding through practice and also through uh, thinking about them and, and observing them and understanding what they are and how they are and how, what, what is what what their function was and can be right i work with ancestral forms of movement and uh, through the work uh, with the anthropologist and his uh, study area uh, i started to learn these two dances from the community this is a masewa masewa dances masewa are now speaking people from the highlands of puebla and they had these two dances uh, in which they embody the mountain. And while looking at these dances, uh, the anthropologist and myself, the anthropologist is a friend and he's also a dancer. This is very important to say. So it's not somebody who looks at the distance, but somebody who embodied the dance. We started to realize that this dance was sort of a, a 3D model of socio-ambiental relations. So it was not like in the modern colonial context, a dance for a spectacle but it was a dance which operated with different, very different uh, ideas. And one of the central idea was that the subjects were not only human, the mountain was also a subject, was not an object like in Western ontologies. And the, the mountain was kind of, could become embodied and could People could account for the mountain and for the future and for the for the relation of care established with the mountain. So it sort of had a lot to do with my situation. The mountain, maybe we can go to the second slide. The mountain I'm talking about was, and when I say was, maybe I should say it is, it is still or was before an apu. And an apu is a uh, in, in Quechua speaking and in the Andean uh, ontologies, a form of being which is not only a mountain. It was translated at, as deity of the mountain. Yet it is a very different relationship. An Apu exists, gives life to the communities that drink the water, that, uh, you know, that live beside or under it in the valleys that this apu can nurture with water. And the communities in their turn also they give life to the apu, to this mountain, which was translated as holy mountain, right? But it's that might be a bit misleading, right? So in one hand, I had these dances that talk about something like apu, right? But they were from Mexico. And on the other hand, I had this mountain I grew up with. I drank water, that water made me through all my childhood till I was 20. And that mountain was being exploited. We can go to the next uh, slide. And exploited in a way that, in the next, yeah, that uh, was endangering, and it is endangering the future life of the communities, the community of my mother, my, the community where I grew up. So in this sense, uh, there was something very real about the research, and I wanted to really understand what is happening when in one hand, this 
transnational cooperation like Strava, like Anglo American, right? Which are intervening the mountain, which are intervening the glaciers, and which are sort of creating an, um, an ecological imbalance in the area. What happens when they are speaking with environmental activists and when they are speaking with indigenous activists? And how is this triangulation, right? Because there was something very weird about that I, that I was always very suspicious uh, because they were not talking about the same thing. The environmental uh, activists were talking about the ecology, right? They were talking about the environment. The environment is still around us, right? Nature is still, if we say nature in Western terms, it is not me, it is there, right, outside. The, this uh, this uh, multinational enterprise is very big, very rich, with a lot of resources, yeah? They are talking about something else, yet yeah, they are talking about nat natural resource, which is a form of merchandise, right? But what are the indigenous activists talking about when they translate themselves and they say nature, environment, natural resource? <laughs> and with this question in mind, I started to research on these dances. I started to, you know, sort of reproduce them, knowing that when I reproduce them, they are not the same. And researching on, 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 on Andean uh, forms of thought and of this, what happens in this sort of, in this encounter. And I found out something super interesting that I, is what I want to share here. It is that actually modernity, as you mentioned before, right? Modernity, I say, I would say modernity, coloniality. I would say, I would look at those phenomena at, at one th as one thing, no? Modernity, coloniality has a very clear idea of what nature is and what humans are, what culture and nature are, right? And in a way, that very particular thought, because it is particular, because, you know, Western thought uh, originates, originates in a particular history, in a particular territory, not so big, right? It, is, it has been expanded through, through the world, right? So in a way, people like in the Andes, people who live in Ayu, who live, communities who live uh, with mountains, not in mountains, but with, in, through another form of relationality, which uh, Mario Blas or some, some theoreticians called strong relationality. They don't think of them as pre-existent, right? And this mountain, uh, or this being, right? And all the beings that conform that bigger being, like this holobionte, right? They sort of co-create themselves and co-sustain themselves. That's strong relationality. But modernity slash coloniality is a weak, has a weak relationality, right? We think we are pre-existent, there is nature out there, and humans who have ideas about nature, which, which can be translated as culture. So in a way, in this encounter, what the Andean people or the people in the, in the northern high, highlands of Puebla are relating with a mountain in a way that exceeds Western ontologies, that exceeds this category of nature culture that has become universal. And because it exceeds it, it's, translate, it's translated as cultural belief. And cultural belief has not the same hierarchy, of course, as the politics that are, you know, rational to, to give to the land, jobs for now, right? Um, economic development, natural resource, et cetera, et cetera. So in a way, in that disbalance, which is, I think, very, very contingent to the discussion today, what other forms of understanding nature or culture, or, and culture do is translated as cosmology. And that has a lesser hierarchy than what science would say about mountain. And when I say science, of course, I'm not talking about new science that is relational, that is strongly about intertwined, but I'm talking about modern science, which in a way sort of still 
uh, impregnates the way we, we relate and the way we, we communicate and also colonial languages that we are speaking. So looking at this dance, I started to see that actually dance could be a form of cosmopolitics, or it was being, actually, it was being in the context of strong relationality of these communities that are in place that don't think of them as separated from place or as the subjects of, our, of an objectual world, yeah? In, in a way, those communities understand the relation with mountain and 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 they coexistent with mountain as a as a non-Western form of ecology, right? And that was very interesting for me because I wanted to see, okay, this dance as a form of knowing is there to enact a strong relationality in which many existence give each other's life and sustain, right? and they emerge together. And in which, in that way, dance is much more potent or has, or it has a possibility of, a political possibility, you know, as a political project, uh, much more strong that, that, that the reduction of, of spectacle only for humans, uh, in a way, aesthetics, right? Which, in a way, it's like a, a strong reduction of what dance mean, means in, in those contexts. And, but that division of hierarchies between the ones who believe and the ones who know, right? The ones who believe are the indigenous communities, the people of color, the, the ones who are defending the water for the next seven generations, and the ones who know politics as usual, the politics of what is rational to be, science, modern science, et cetera, et cetera. In this encounter, what is what sort of patrols that division or that status, no? And Mario Blaser, which I, I would like to read a quote here because I think he does a very beautiful, he would say, he would propose that who patterned this division would be universal science. And by universal science, I quote, he refers to an ensemble of always changing and situated uh, uh, re relations between law state and the practices of knowing that reclaim a scientific status in which they kind of pile up together and they protect any sort of defiance of their pretensions of knowing ultimate truth. So in a way, the communities defending the mountain are then coined as, they are thought of as irrational, right? They don't want to exploit the resources. They don't want to create jobs. They don't. They don't eat, and then don't leave others eat. And in this, in this sort of place, we can. And and I love a strong, a strong relational uh, societies and communities because they are very strong contrast, right, to this modernity coloniality, which is a weak relation. So it's a very big contrast. But in this contrast we can really look at how this one world narrative, right, reduces other narratives and the, and the methods of reduction, right, which are invisible. Because in a way, if we don't look at the, at the, at the narrative of modernity, if we, don't, if we don't start to see it as a narration, right, and, and we don't start to see, okay, that narration has a base and in that base, uh, for example, humans have distance from nature through culture, right? Nature is pre-existent, is there. Humans are also pre-existent. They are the subjects. All, all other beings are more object-like, right? If we don't look at that, which in a way climbs behind us in the way we speak about it, when we say the environment, when, we, when people say like, I wanna connect with nature. Like if we don't start to do that work, for me, the ecology is, is, a, is it, it doesn't go out of the loop. It reproduces that which is, which is creating this crisis. So I wanted to sort of share this uh, first because I think it is beautiful to, to look at dance for sure, not only as uh, through the lens of uh, modern coloniality, to look at, uh, at collectives 
in which not only humans, of course, are, are represented. And to look at dance as a form of, of knowing, of knowledge, in which bodies of humans can understand through felt uh, experience how other bodies, bodies of water, bodies of rivers, bodies of mountains, feel and, and exist from a perspective which is not through distance. And I think, yeah, that, that would be like a, 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 a sort of a very hard uh, sum up of, of what, I'm, what I wanted to contribute here. And, and also like maybe explaining a bit that these forms of dance are also thought of as forms of reciprocity. And, and there, there, I think they, are, they, are, they stand for, for forms of offering, which is radically different if we think about art uh, in, in the West or, or art as institution of art, right? Which in a way is part of the pedagogies of modernity, right? Dance, the museum, <laughs> the cultural center have been historically part of the pedagogy of modernity, which is this, the transmission and the sort of um, spreading of this one narrative in which what others think of a mountain, in this case, an ancestor or a being more than human, which we are dependent from in, with whom we can converse or relate through some practices of trans and, and, and embodiment can only be geology, natural resource, environment, and merchandise. So that, that is more, more or less the proposal and thinking about the notion of Apu like something which exceeds the concept of mountain. Um, I propose to decolonize the way we think ecology itself through embodied practices. It's because we, we don't have nothing if we only have a, a, a sort of a decolonial theories. <laughs> we need mm -hmm. decolonial practices. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that would be the proposal for you to think of. Mm. Thank you, Amanda. That's so strong, that proposal of... Um challenging, deconstructing the inheritance of almost an over-intellectualization -intellectu that creates the separation by proposing and foregrounding embodiment um, and practice as a way of creating this kind of strong relationality that you're talking about. And I hope that we have the opportunity when we go into the panel discussion to take that apart more and to speak about some of the practices that you um, employ in your own practice so we can get a, a more tangible idea of that. But thank you so much for that generous and rigorous sharing. Thank you. And I, thank you. And I wanted to just go sh shortly through the pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just to finish the, yeah. So uh, some pictures of the publications that we have been doing, you can go up. Uh, yeah. Uh, pictures of the dancers and of the original costumes of the dance. Climatic dance as a project, ecosomatic practices as, as what, I, well, what I was talking before, to end up with the mountain as, as a living being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I want to take this opportunity to segue to our next speaker, Maria Lucia Cruz Correa. The artistic work of Maria Lucia Cruz Correa expresses her deep commitment to ecological themes and the climate crisis. In response to the various environmental conflicts of our time, she brings the public and communities together in participatory laboratories. In it, she connects the artistic with the voices of scientists, activists, and lawyers in long-term research processes. 
Korea's visual installations, performances, and participatory laboratories depict a sense of cosmopolitan relationship between humans and the more than human world. As a designer, Korea creates temporary utopian services, a kind of lab to recover from the impact of the Anthropocene, extractivism, and the climate crisis. Its tools and methodologies are based on practices such as systemic constellation, conscious agreement, restorative justice, activism, and scientific research. Her work was supported by the Imagine 2020 network until 2020, and in 2020, she started a trajectory as an artist at WP Zimmer in Belgium. Currently, her work is supported by networks such as Green Art Global Alliance of the EU, Displacement Journeys, Be Part, and Terra Batida. Maria Lucia, how are you doing tonight? I'm very good, thank you. And where are you joining us from? I'm joining very close from you, from Ghent. <laughs> <laughs> very close indeed. Uh, so would you like to share with us uh, some of your perspectives from your practice that are relating to the theme of environmental justice as social justice? Yes. First of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here amongst Amanda and Grace and you, Copano. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I will try to share a bit my perspective by navigating a bit through the, proje the projects that I have been doing uh, the last years, which somehow are my way of giving or responses or activate my tools to, yeah, to interact to, with the teams of climate justice. And um, yeah, I share the same uh, feeling, not exactly the same, but similar to Amanda, that I'm also coming from a very small village at the coast of Portugal. And uh, yeah, the presence of nature was very vivid until uh, I was 14. And living in such an environment, of course, gave me the sense of kinship and care for nature that I carry in my heart until I moved to Belgium. <laughs> And uh, so, to be honest, is where I start my reactive, <laughs> impulsive, um, compulsive uh, projects on environmental destruction, which was very present for me uh, when I moved here. But also uh, to say that my, I'm trained as a designer, so I try to look always at uh, ways that we can somehow aid society to, to imagine the type of products that society would need <laughs> to help Earth and support and give care for it. Mm. And um, for me, a bit um, to contextualize uh, my approach at this moment for the climate justice is focusing on the recognition of the rights of nature and ecocide as a missing crime in the Roman statute, but also to understand uh, the colonial impact that uh, we as humans are doing on Earth and seeing this as the root of the climate problematics, because we cannot talk about climate without talking about the ecocide that we are doing to Earth, to Gaia. And um, so one of the first projects I did uh, on uh, understanding a bit why the rights of nature were not <laughs> yet implemented in most of the countries in the world, uh, was uh, actually more or less at the same time uh, that I, in my village in Portugal, uh, an oil company was going to do offshore uh, extraction. And this was right like 15 kilometers from the coast. And I saw the panic also from the people that are living in my village that I miss a lot. <laughs> Um, and uh, that was really like the, the call for me, but why isn't there a right that would prevent this to happen? And uh, then I start to investigate and uh, I discover, well, that Ecuador was at that time the only country that has the rights of nature in the constitution. And more or less at the same time, New Zealand grant personhood to a river, which is also a very anthropocentric con context and wording of granting uh, personhood. Why would we grant personhood to a river? Um, so my starting point was to actually to go on a field research to Ecuador 
and to kind of understand from my European perspective, which is maybe more disconnected than uh, um, uh, Ecuadorian perspective or even uh, from South Americans, uh, that uh, we are kind of this, have this disconnecting um, approach to what nature is, being as nature, but being part of nature, but also how we relate to it, because in some way, how I feel is that I'm part of a collective trauma that we are all going through, that is the collective environmental trauma caused by colonialism and capitalism. But at the same time, what I feel that is happening is that we don't even acknowledge that trauma. And that makes us completely alienated as humans because we no longer know where we belong and we no longer uh, understand our kinship with the natural world or nature or natural habitats or more than human. And uh, so my first focus on that research was to uh, understand the what is an environmental crime, which is a very complex thing to understand in terms of temporality. So if you imagine uh, a murder is something that happens in the moment that someone shoots a gun and the other person falls dead. But when we talk about a river uh, or a mountain um, or a forest, we can't imagine that uh, crime happening like as a straight vision that this is a crime. So the impossibility of uh, lawyers to also like present cases where uh, a river is the entity uh, uh, in, in the courtroom, it's uh, quite difficult to see in the juridical justice system. So uh, the case that I, uh, that I was studying was uh, two, three cases. One that was uh, in Ecuador, uh, the Sarayaku community that uh, won successfully the case court uh, and they prevent that the um, uh, uh, mining company from uh, Argentina did the extraction in their lands. So it was for me like the case that I see, okay, justice works somehow, but because they have also the rights of nature in the constitution. And the other case was uh, an oil spill that happened in the 60s. So I could see already the effects that have passed like after 40 years. So most of the population was uh, left with the cancer or if not dead. And that was very touching because, you know, also my uh, wanting to uh, have this field research was also to understand why me as a European person cannot acknowledge these crimes because it's so far. Why can't we have empathy for the crimes that are doing, being done globally, but in a micro level, we feel that we are not part of it. So this is for me a very important uh, way of linking uh, also globally our stories because we cannot think of ecocide without connecting all the different territories because we are interconnected as the ecosystem is interconnected and this earth uh, is combining all our lives together. And uh, in that sense, that was uh, uh, the other way to see the past, uh, the present and the future, which was uh, the case of North Dakota that was happening at that time, which I, I strongly believe that uh, uh, the CEO Lakota community and all the people that joined in that camp would somehow prevent that crime. It was the moment when the weapon was being inserted in the river. And that is the, the moment that I thought, okay, this is the moment that we as, as people could prevent that crime. But again, uh, the, the enforcement of corporation legislation is much stronger than the, the power of people when it comes to the rights and protection of the ecosystem. So, that left me with a lot of doubts when I came from that research. And one of my main questions was how can I, as a European citizen, understand those relations and share that knowledge with people around me that lost the sense of interconnectedness, even uh, talking by myself because I'm part of this colonial trauma that we, uh, that we somehow uh, live through our history, but we don't even understand that is there. So I think that is one of the first uh, steps that for me was very important was that acknowledgement. And um, so for that project, I created, um, uh, we 
with the team, uh, uh, a big team, that I'm still very thankful for it because it was my first YouTube piece. <laughs> um, and um, so what we tried to do was the seven impossible attempts to represent a non-human uh, entity in a courtroom. So, of course, that left a lot of doubts. We tried to uh, present the impossibilities, but at the same time uh, stimulate that change, that encouragement and that inspiration that we could all take this role of guardians and protectors and earth keepers, which is in all of us. And uh, to also to try to see the other perspective of that we um, could think differently. And justice could take a step forward. That's why I look into restorative justice, which is uh, another form of looking at um, the criminal or the perpetrator, which is crucial for understanding the, the climate justice, which is we are focused on the perpetrators, but what we need now is a restoration of the earth. And what the earth needs is all of us looking at ways that we can restore the damaged relationship and to bring balance into the ecosystem. And when I talk balance, I don't talk about harmony. I don't talk about let's go back to the wild. Let's, uh, you know, I talk about trying to restore what no longer exists because we are surrounded with that. We are surrounded by an ecosystem that has been destroyed over a colonial past that we are part of it. So, I think uh, for the project, which was actually uh, very inspiring <laughs> to come about and understanding the error that we all carry inside and we don't admit that we carry inside. Um, and uh, the ending of the project was uh, a restorative contract. And uh, that was the most exciting part of it because the restorative justice uh, is exactly that. It's the forgiveness between perpetrator and victim. It's the reconciliation between the perpetrator and victim. And if we take in acknowledge that we are part, all of us, uh, of this ecocide crime as perpetrators, victims, and witnesses, we uh, have the, the stand to take care of our part, the part in you that is no longer connected with nature and is part of that crime. So uh, I think that is also a bit my <laughs> um, question for today, is to bring the knowledge of what is our role or what is our part in, as a duty of care and responsibility for the crimes that are part of our history as humans. Mm. But also to share my history as you know, wanting to know more and wanting to engage more and knowing that I'm not coming from an indigenous community, but I am coming with a, uh, from um, a culture that once also <laughs> had cultural and had uh, understanding and was living in some sort of symbiosis with nature. Of course, we cannot live in symbiosis with nature, but we, we can have a, a, a reciprocal relationship, which is... Uh, not damaging more than what we did. And the other question is like, if we think we only extract, we only colonize, we only um, dominate, but what we as citizens are giving back to nature. Did we ever give back something to nature? So this is also like a question that I find very important uh, for today. It's how can we now give something in return? because nature should not be the slave of our resources and capitalistic system. We should understand each other as equal. And that part comes with the idea of also recognizing the rights of nature because it's not about um, uh, creating this idea of domination, but it's more about how can we see each other as equal so that we don't create further harm. And um, so with this wrapping, I want to uh, a bit conclude also that uh, after the, that project, the trial of nature, then I decided to imagine a fictional institute that I call Kin Institute. That is an idea to only propose projects as services for the earth uh, with the idea that we can uh, kind of um, 
bring the projects as a repairing system or a protocol of care that we as humans can uh, bring about change. And that change we talk about climate, because if we think about climate is the last effect of all these environmental crimes that we have been doing. And so together with um, uh, experts of restorative justice, environmental uh, uh, law, uh, architect, but also uh, now I, I invited also scientists that are working specifically on reparation of territories uh, in the sense of also cleaning oil spills. So it's about sharing this idea of how could we support that uh, reparation, but also how could we engage uh, in further work with the communities to support their uh, trauma because we are also part of uh, yeah, a society that is bringing that trauma to, to the communities that are at stake when it comes to the, the crimes of extractivism. And um, yeah, so to look at um, what I can contribute for today, it's also to challenge us as thinking how can we hold this darkness and this colonial history and the destruction while finding like ecological and holistic cultural renewal, which is what we all need. It's like restoration of ourselves as also part of nature. And um, so I think if we, if we think about climate, we cannot uh, further imagine reparations such as geoengineering, um, which is like, putting cosmetics on nature, but we have to go back a lot of steps to the roots of the problem. And it's an invitation to rethink our future relationships with the environment where we live, but also with um, the people around us that are part of this ecological uh, chaotic that is also caused in us that we try to do our best in everything we can to not uh, do further harm, but at the same time, it's so simple, is to listen to the heart and hear what we can get from our intuition that can support the change, which is to be in reciprocal relationship with nature. And I think over the pandemic, I have a feeling that there was kind of something moving because we went towards uh, a more, uh, degrowth <laughs> and slowness and that already brought and you could see a lot of transformation happening and I think we should keep that transformation that was happening over the course of nine months and I know that pandemic is also a really strong effect in us but to take that into the future yeah I think I <laughs> That's really, really powerful. Thank you so much, Maria Lucia. I think the thing that I'm struck the most by in your practice is the way in which you are negotiating what it is that we have done collectively as a, as a species, let's say, as a human species on the planet. The inheritances, the things that we are inheriting from previous generations that have been so damaging, that have been so violent. Um, and the, 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 the hope that in taking up the responsibility for what it is that we have done collectively, that there is the possibility of reparation, but only until, as a collective, we recognize the harm that we have either done or participated in or witnessed, um, but in any of those situations have been a part of. Um, I find that really powerful and I hope that we have the opportunity to pick that apart a bit more when we go into um, the panel discussion part of the evening. But thank you very much for what you've offered thus far. It's been really powerful. Thank you. And finally, we are arriving at our final speaker of the evening. Grace Ndritu is a British Kenyan artist who's Artworks are connected with the transformation of our contemporary world through her films, photography, paintings, and social practice projects with refugees, migrants, and indigenous groups. Works like the ARC Center for Interdisciplinary Experimentation, Coverslut, Fashion, and an Economic Project 
and shamanic performance art series, Healing the Museum, have been shown all around the world. Recent exhibitions include Blue Coat Gallery in Liverpool, SMAC and MSK in Belgium, Eastside Projects in Birmingham, CAG Vancouver, Museum Modern Art in Warsaw, and the Musée Chasse and Nature and Centre Pompidou in Paris. Good evening, Grace. How are you doing? Hello. <laughs> I'm well. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Where, where are you okay. calling in from? Well, actually, I'm in Brussels, so uh, not that far. <laughs> not too far. Just a train ride away. The same weather. <laughs> the same bad weather. <laughs> the same terrible weather. So I, I would love to invite you from your perspective and from your practice to share a little bit um, around how your practice intersects in the environmental justice conversation and the social justice conversation. Yes, um, maybe I'll start with a little bit of my background. So um, my family uh, from rural Kenya, so I grew up there, but also in a working class neighborhood in Birmingham, England. So this is why I have this contrasting um, experience. Um, and that obviously affected my way of understanding the world, um, of being in non-Western and Western um, contexts as a child. Um, and um, I have spent a lot of time because of because of my upbringing, I should say, my mother, she was an activist um, and she was very, her and her friends, they had this uh, uh, women's group called uh, Women of the Third World and they would have film screenings and do a lot of protest stuff. And so I grew up in quite a political household. Um, so ideas of activism and um, community, you know, were part of the norm. And at the same time, ideas to do with, um, let's say, this idea of plurality um, to do with religion and spirituality. And that's really affected my work. And so I guess it's interesting. Um, uh, maybe if you show the images, um, and you just start to show the images and just change them every, I don't know, 20 seconds or something. Um, so tonight I'm going to focus maybe on a, um, um, a body of work called Healing the Museum. So I began Healing the Museum in 2012, and this was really about um, this idea of reintroducing like non-rational methodologies like shamanism and meditation into the museum context because I felt that museums were dying because they were so disconnected with what was going on outside. Um, politically and with the general public that something needs to change. So I started doing this series of performances and that's how healing kind of came into my work. And so for me, I guess I see healing as a means um, of a way of creating a platform in order to bring different voices together that are not normally shown together or given space together especially those of it opposing opinions. And so, uh, for example, um, the images you're probably watching now uh, of a project in the Goethe, in, um, that I did for the Goethe Institute in Brussels. Um, and this is a project about the restitution of African objects um, um, from European museums back to Africa. And so this was quite a big project that was curated by Jana Hackel, which involved different artists, activists, um, museum directors and scientists and academics from Africa and also from Europe. And we would go to different museums in Europe and discuss the different collections. And so for one of the collections uh, and one of the conferences, um, because normally there were like closed workshops uh, with a group of 20 people who would discuss, you know, anything from the practical um, aspects of museum collections all the way to um, more artistic um, aspects. And so it was great because we would discuss things like the law or the security issues of sending objects back to Africa, but also... Um, in my work especially, about the ramifications of what that would do and what that meant in terms of the object's um, consciousness, let's say. And so um, 
one of the things that I decided to do um, for this project was actually, um, if you're, if you can, sh and you show me the images. I can't see. Yeah, I can't see the images. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so um, for this project, um, it took place in the Tavera Museum. And this was obviously a very controversial um, museum in, in Belgium because um, not only it's uh, past history, but also because it had been closed for 10 years and was meant to have gone through this big decolonial um, change. And so um, this conference took place in the first month of it actually reopening. And so I decided to uh, turn things on the head and to do a performance where we would have um, all the players, um, but whether they were the directors of museums, like so from the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, which is another controversial museum, to the activists who were like anti-Humboldt. Um, if you just go back to the last slide, actually, well, I'm just saying this part. Um, I decided what to do um, was to get everyone to do um, a, a meditative performance because I'm very interested in kind of like holistic um, learning. And um, so this took place in the gem and mineral room. So the gem and mineral room in the Tiburon Museum is very loaded space because obviously we know that those gems and minerals that they only are in Belgium because of this history of colonialism, you know, and this kind of idea to do with blood diamonds and things. And so what I decided to do is to get everybody to kind of sit in the room and to sit on the floor and to meditate and to then kind of connect with the objects in the space and then talk about it. And so this had like a really big effect. Um, so some of the African artists and scientists, they started to get really upset because they felt they were like connecting with a lot of the heavy energy of, you know, of the past. And then, so this changed the, the atmosphere of the conference because what happened, it was a very cathartic experience. So that meant that afterwards, when we went back into the more, you know, formal um, conference, it meant that the conversation went to a much deeper level because we'd have this kind of bonding experience. And this kind of, you know, this example of this way of working, it kind of highlights to me the Western um, way of thinking about how that the world is a dead place, you know, and whereas most of the world thinks of it as um, in a more animistic or let's say is a, is a living being. And this is a really good example when we're looking at the director of the African Museum, for example, he had never really sat on the floor of his museum, you know, for the last 20 years. And so he was completely disconnected with the objects actually in the museum. And so this also leads me into thinking and some of my research I've been doing about how we value objects, why we value them and the way we do. So like why we value them normally monetarily first, uh, then culturally, and maybe at the end spiritually. So these are kind of important questions for me. Um, maybe we can start the slides again. Yeah. And so in thinking about the other questions um, about how certain practices like shamanism and meditation have impacted my practice, and you could say maybe my politics, um, I think it's from a fundamental belief that um, this idea that the shaman is the creator and the healer and the artist, but and but also is part of this bigger um, sense of being, and also how that is a part of a political process, and how as an artist, even even if I'm a contemporary artist and um, a shamanic practitioner. I believe that artists have a duty to remake the world to be a better place. And so I've been working on that in different ways. Um, and so I think this also comes from this understanding for the last, I could say, 20 years where I've been having, because um, when I finished um, my studies, um, 
at that time, um, spirituality wasn't, it wasn't cool to meditate or wasn't cool to, you know, be interested in that kind of thing. So, um, you know, it was quite still quite divided. So activists were, you know, very focused on changing things externally and spiritual people, you could say, were much more, you know, you could say even navel gazing. And so there's, but there's come to a point now where a lot of activists have realized that they're getting burnt out, you know, and, and that's no good. And they need to think about issues to do with care and spirituality, spiritual practitioners have kind of accepted that escapism is no answer either. Um, maybe we can go, yeah, faster through the slides, maybe every 10, <laughs> five seconds, 10 seconds. Um, also, I think that in my work as well, I've kind of tried to use um, shamanism as a political tool, um, for example, in different projects that I've done. So in 2018, I did a project um, here in Brussels um, at the end of 2017, 2018, that was about healing trauma. And this was about using food, shamanism and meditation to do so. And um, this was in the tally lab. And I worked with two sets groups of people. So this was um, one set that were like activists and artists and um, also refugees, that was the main group. And then on the other side, there were people who worked in the EU Parliament, uh, um, NATO, and also uh, the UN. And so for four months, I worked with these groups separately and I gave them different um, free meditation classes um, to the actual, um, to the refugees, but also for the people who work in the agencies, I work with them on creative visualization because that, that's one thing about that kind of very bureaucratic job. It really limits the scope to come up with new ideas because they have to fulfill some, certain sort of charters. And so after four months of working in this way, I brought the two groups together to do a shamanic performance and this is powerful because it involves people and it doesn't really matter whether you're the director or you're an intern or you're a refugee or, you know, it doesn't really matter what kind of job you've got on the outside. Once you're on the floor, you're just a body on a floor next to another body. And so for this shamanic performance, uh, the, because there's always an intention and it's always a political intention, this was about healing trauma. And a lot of the participants saw things to do with uh, climate change. And so some really powerful things came out of that project. Um, one of the parliament people, um, because of what she saw during her shamanic journey, she actually um, decided to kind of um, start a think tank um, in the parliament to discuss about the rights of climate refugees. Because at the moment in the UN, um, if you come to, if you come here because of a, a, a disaster or war or something, it's fine. But if you come because of climate change, you can't get status. So she ended up writing this paper and starting this think tank and it all came out of this performance. So I'm very interested in how something so um, non-rational like shamanism or art can actually have like real world effects. And that kind of brings me to some other projects that I've been working on. Um, so some of the images you're seeing now are, are in Vancouver. Um, and so when I'm thinking about the broader context of my work to do with environmental and social justice. I've been working on um, three, three research projects, but they kind of intersect. One of them is a week-long workshop I did at the UBC, so the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, called Healing Justice, where I worked with students, activists, artists, and First Nation members. Um, through different practices, whether that's reading, um, meditating, um, discussion, uh, and visiting sites. 
uh, one of the sites we're visiting was an environmental justice site. Um, if you can, if you can stop there, or, or actually go back. Sorry, these slides. If you go back, back. Yeah, go back. Sorry. Again. Again. Yeah, so, um, so I worked on that with these different groups. And this was actually part of, um, this was in 2019. And actually it was really amazing because even though uh, the start of the week, you know, we began at the university within this more academic context, and because of um, the people that we met naturally through doing the process, um, we were invited in the end to a traditional pipe ceremony uh, by the First Nations and a traditional sweat lodge ceremony as well. And this really gave me a chance to also share some of the knowledge about what I had been learning about the um, Goethe project that I told you about, so about the restitution project about sending objects back to Africa. And this actually then began um, a kind of idea about thinking about healing on a on even in a kind of bigger level. And so I decided that for 2020, at the beginning of 2020, that 2020 was going to be the year of black healing. So this was before the pandemic had started and kind of before um, any social um, unrest had started with George Floyd and all the Black Lives Matter protests. So I began the year uh, thinking that actually this project was actually to do with um, my relationship to, um, first of all, the fact that Macron, President Macron, who actually he had um, asked for a report, a famous, it's quite a famous report about this um, restitution issue. Um, in 2016, and had promised to actually send objects back to Africa, but no objects had been sent back. And so instead, France had decided that Africa was going to be the theme, it would be Africa 2020. And so I decided, no, um, 2020 would be the year of black healing. And so, um, so that was kind of an artistic direct response to that. And so after... I began the year in Vancouver. Um, I also then ended up um, and working in the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver in a conference um, about um, Africa studies. And I was invited to work in the collection at the MOA. And so my ideas, and um, which are really inspired by some amazing activists called B to B, BP to, or not to BP, so BP, British Petroleum. Uh, these are amazing activists who have been working, uh, fighting against um, the British Museum and their corporate sponsorship you know, by British Petroleum. And so the ideas of stolen land, stolen objects and stolen future um, in relating to climate change and how these kind of this intersection of those three layers um, come together. And so, what was interesting as well about a side note, I should say, about, about the Goethe project is how um, it was a pan-European project. So we had gone to different museums in France, Germany, Belgium, Spain, and Italy, uh, but the British Museum wasn't involved in that. And, uh, but the British Museum obviously, had, obviously has a huge collection of African objects and Egyptian artifacts. And so, um, this, this idea of this broader context of environmental and social justice um, also connects to uh, the last slides. Um, if we start again, um, and to do with research that I then went to Argentina um, at the beginning of, uh, after Vancouver, so in 2020, in February 2020. And I'd already I lived in Buenos Aires before that. Um, if we can go forward in the slides, please. No, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. 
Yeah, and now, yeah, just these are the last slides. If we do um, five seconds. And so, yeah, so I began the year in Argentina and I'd already previously done um, a residency in Buenos Aires and lived there a little bit. So I'd already done some research about the history of Argentina and the genocide of Mapuche indigenous people in that history and the history of uh, colonialism. And so this time um, I had gone there to actually work on, um, to write a script for a film I was making. But part of the research was to understand more about that history uh, by talking to um, Mapuche communities and going to visit them, but also um, working with scientists and anthropologists and looking at the long-term effects of climate change in that region. And so it was a great opportunity you know, to be able to do both at the same time and to uh, even understand even more how this different way of thinking, you know, this opposing way of thinking, you know, uh, if, 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 you, if one believes that the earth is dead, um, why care for it? You know, if that's actually your belief and you only see it as a resource, why, why care for it? And so this understanding of this idea of Pachamama as being a whole being um, is part of that project. And goes back to what I was saying about this stolen land, stolen culture, stolen climate. And so in my practice, um, I'm interested about the connection between decolonizing museums and environmental justice and ritual. So whether that's shamanism, meditation, and also um, to do with community. And so how that is um, then in contrast to ideas of mass extinction and dystopia and um, late capitalism in Western culture. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Grace. I think it goes without saying that you have an extensive practice that extends across multiple spaces, discourses, peoples. Um, so I, I really want to thank you for the generosity in going through the processes that you're undergoing um, trying to do that connecting and bridging work across those discourses and bringing people that um, are not necessarily generally in conversation with one another to a context where they may be able to have a conversation that is potentially reparative and potentially um, transcending the ways in which we generally converse around this subject matter. So I, I'm very interested to see how that plays out in your practice and how you navigate and facilitate those kinds of spaces with those kinds of different, uh, different people. Um, and maybe this is a good time to remind the audience that uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop those into the Vimeo chat or the Facebook chat if you're watching this via Facebook. Um, but I would like to go right back to you, Grace, um, with a question as we go into our panel discussion now. And just a note to all the speakers, if anything is coming up for you that you would like to uh, present to one of the other um, speakers on the panel, please feel free to just put up your hand or just to jump in if you have a question. Um, but back to you, Grace, I think it would be really interesting to hear for you um, what is the role of reparations specifically in providing justice for black people and the environment and indigenous peoples? Um, and what, in your view, with the research that you've done specifically with museums, what role can museums, the cultural center, uh, I mean the cultural sector, play in the role of reparative justice and reparations to black and indigenous peoples? Okay, well, that's a huge question. <laughs> so um, I should I should have said also part of my role I feel is also bringing knowledge to different indigenous or grassroots communities. So you know because the First Nation um, communities that I was with they feel kind of isolated in their struggle and not realizing it's the same struggle that the Mapuche are going through and the same struggle that actually um, diasporic um, communities in Africa, diasporic communities in Europe are going through. And so I do feel like there's, it's important to kind of go and share that knowledge, um, you know, a, in a kind of grassroots <coughs> way, um, as well as working with these, you could say, bigger players in different projects. Um, for me, I guess, yeah, this question about 
relationships between institutions, museums, black and indigenous people, and environmental justice. I think I first should say that for me, what's always disturbed me is this idea that, um, you know, climate change or anti-climate change movements have always been largely a white uh, movement. So you can see that in something like Extinction Rebellion. And so this continuous denial uh, that there have been extinctions before that. And some, that's something that black communities and indigenous peoples have known throughout their histories that there have been other extinctions before this extinction. Uh, through whether that's through slavery or through colonialism. And so that's really important to bring that into the foreground and not just to be in the back. And that this, so that this struggle is shared and that therefore there's a recognition of the humanity of um, those peoples. And so I've been really interested in this actually recently, this Brazilian, um, you can see this um, book, it's a Brazilian activist, um, Alton Krinak, who says something about that um, normally these communities and, and those people in them are not really considered as individuals, but they're always seen as collective peoples. Um, and so that makes it much easier to dismiss their, their concerns um, in the sense that, um, I, as a black person, cannot speak for all black people, but there's always a pressure that I must speak for all black people. And that's something that I'm starting to see in the art world, um, that people have to really start to understand that. You know, I'll just give a simple example that, you know, just like there are different types of white people, there are different types of black people, you know, not all black artists and all black people have the same ethical or moral background. You know, for example, Kanye West <laughs> is a good example. You know, his willingness to embrace Trump um, is a complete contradiction to my um, kind of policies, let's say, even though we're both, um, you could say, black people. And so I think that's something that white curators need to be aware of uh, when working with these things and that, they shouldn't just jump on the bandwagon of doing anti-racist work or decolonial work because of white guilt without actually researching the underlying um, politics of artists or, I uh, don't know, groups or whatever that they decide to work with. Because the two things kind of go together. And I guess that's, you know, why intersectionality and people understanding that, you know, environmental justice is racial justice, is environmental justice. That's like the importance of that. And so I, I feel like for institutions, especially in Europe and North America, that they need to understand that, yeah, it's, it, it's important to face white guilt and look at your own white guilt and take responsibility, but it's also important to make intelligent choices. <laughs> So when you're remodeling and you're thinking, OK, we want to remake the museum, just hiring a black person, you know, um, is not going to do the job, you know, um, because, like I said, all black people can have different types of politics. So, you know, um, like all women can have different types of politics, not all women are the same. I mean, Margaret Thatcher versus Sylvia Federici, very different women, <laughs> but they belong to the same gender. Um, and so I think that's really something, and in terms of collecting um, black art or indigenous art, this, this is also a complicated thing because of course you need to insert different histories into, I'm just talking about uh, the history of art, like visual art. So into the history of art, you need to in, you know, in, inform different histories, but you can't just erase also the history that's being told. You know, there has to be, you have to kind of contextualize. So I feel like um, the best museums are willing to look at their collections and to kind of own their mistakes, but not dumb it down for the public, you know, so they can say, hey, yeah, we have these problematic um, objects. And in our history, our history, like for example, with the Tate collection or something, um, or the Tate buildings, we know that those buildings were paid for for money through um, 
slavery and the plantations, you know, money that's made from the sugar plantations. And so Tate really needs to own that history um, to be able to really talk about then doing any kind of decolonial work or, you know, having an interest in um, collecting or working with black artists if they're really interested in doing anti-racist work. Otherwise, if they just collect or like work with black artists, it can be done from a neoliberal point of view and therefore it just feeds back into the system. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just to, that's, that's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, comprehensive. Thank you so much. And I think I, I want to bring uh, Amanda in on this point because, uh, Grace, you were talking a lot about um, the ways in which structures like museums, structures like cultural centers can reduce people to their identities and homogenize groups like black people into one category in order to try and appear as if they're decolonizing, as if they have an anti-racist agenda. And Amanda, you were speaking about the way in which cultural belief is a mechanism that reduces the validity of indigenous cosmologies. And I was interested if you could speak more about that idea, if you could speak more about the mechanisms in museums, in cultural centers, in the art world, and more broadly in society um, of those mechanisms, how they are operationalized against indigenous peoples to reduce those valid claims of indigenous land rights and indigenous sovereignty. Uh, yes, thank you, Gubana. That's a nice question. And I wanted to start, like, I'm going in that direction, but I do a small detour. I wanted to quote Ailton Krenak as well, thinking of, when he talks about uh, mining accidents, no? He was close to La Vallée, mining spill, landslide, yeah, huge toxic relave waste into villages, indigenous villages uh, among them. So he says uh, indigenous, uh, so he says mining accidents are not accidents. They are incidents produced by a very particular form of language. So when we talk about, when I talk about coloniality, modernity, I talk about a form of language that is rhizomatic. It's not, it doesn't come from top to bottom, you know, we enact. It is part of our habit of understanding what the world is. It is part of our, let's say, the building bricks of how we, of our ontology and our epistemology, like how we understand and how we learn. So for me, when, when, um, when one ontology exerts superiority among others, and that's the history of Western thought, and the museum the theater, I said it before, university are part of the are part of the dissemination, yeah, of that ontology which exerts superiority among all others by erasing them, by destroying them, yeah, by 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 allowing us to forget forms of kinship that connect us with ancestrality with everything that is alive, no? Because if we look at, for example, in the case of Krenak, Amazonian or Amerindian in general, ontologies, we don't have this separation between nature and culture as, as in Western thought, but we have, for example, in the Andes, people, people, and people, earth. And people, earth is a mountain, and it has a character, and it, it's, it, it has a certain temperament. It is, a, it is a particular eye, right? Like people jaguar is an eye, or people plant. So that ontology and that epistemology, that, that ra ra rational mind, as, as Grace says, right, this form of knowing through distance, which is at the root of modern science, right? Bacon and so on, English people, English men, right? Unveiling the secrets of nature. It's, it's very, it's kind of, you can me too that, you know, <laughs> unveil, strip up, like make, and, and somehow it's a female subject, you know, you, you strip, you strip this female subject in order to understand its secrets. So you can dominate, control. That form of knowing and, and that form of uh, learning are not universal. And I think it's extremely important to start thinking about coloniality as something that happened in the past but understand it as, as this what comes 
inside that uh, slips inside of our conversations is slip inside the way we understand things and the way we relate with humans and non-humans. And in that context, all what is not that form of thought, yeah, which appears to be universe, universal and is validated by that, what I called uh, universal science, right? This, this togetherness between state, forms of, of, of knowledge that are considered scientific, right? And the law, this, this kind of uh, togetherness, they will reduce all other forms of thought into cultural belief. And they will do that because that is exactly the interesting thing about uh, modernity coloniality, which is it appears to be universi universal and it is not. So when indigenous people say this is not a mountain, it is an apu, and an apu is not only a mountain, and we can relate with the apu through rituals of reciprocity that involve our bodies and involve dance, that apu cannot, cannot enter into the ontology of Western modern thought. It's, it exceeds it. It, 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 cannot, it cannot understand, it cannot digest that. And then immediately is expelled as a lesser form of knowing, as a lesser form of uh, cosmology, right? But listen, what about Western cosmology? <laughs> you know, how does it operate? In which way, um, in which way it reproduces certain forms of superiority, certain forms of thoughts, certain, like like what Maria Lucia said so beautiful, when you give personhood to a river, right? <laughs> yeah, there you. Yeah, okay, it's great. We need we do it because it, it makes sense, right? Whatever, but look at the move, right? You, anyhow. So, so, so for me, it is super interesting to start looking at, at coloniality not as a historical moment, but really as a as a as a as a ontology, as a form of thought, and to and as Marisol de la Cadena, which I'm very, which for me is a very inspiring anthropologist, and her work is beautiful. Her work on Earth beings, I would really uh, recommend to read, where she really understand this problematic in the Andes, and she translated right. She translated. Tira Kuna, people Earth into Earth being, thus sort of making it a bit understanding to, to Western thought. Uh, in, in that particular situation, I really think that we need to start creating these ontological openings, right? In order to look at Western Western thought and its organization, in order to take to to, to this, somehow create sort of fissura, sort of uh, breaks in it, destructure it a bit, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to allow um, many worlds to exist and not this world made out of only one world, which mm -hmm. is the proposal of, of colonial modernity. Mm. Very strong. Thank you so much. And I, I think specifically what's, what's, what's coming up for me in connection with uh, Maria Lucia, a lot of what you were speaking about, um, Amanda, you were speaking about the systems that are developed from, a, let's say, a Western cosmology that are made universal and then are used to um, as oppressive mechanisms. And Maria Lucia, you also speak about how there's a particular usefulness, a utility in um, using the mechanism of personhood giving personhood to a river in order to protect it within the legal framework. Um, but if we think about the kind of historical trajectory of the law, especially from a Western cosmological perspective, the law is the framework that has been used to justify many of the oppressive systems that we have lived through up until this point. So it was through the law and the, the doctrine of discovery that colonialism was explained and was moralized uh, through the Christian church. And then later we have laws that make it uh, possible and legal to own people, to own black people, to own indigenous people, um, to prevent women from gaining access to the workplace, uh, 
sustaining themselves, all facilitated through the structure of law. And what you are proposing is that it is important as one step, let's say, um, to use the law in order to be able to protect nature. But I wonder what your thoughts are with that problematic trajectory of the history of law. Um, what your thoughts are around the potential problematics of that framework and using that framework and what kind of trouble we can get into when we participate with Western cosmology that creates these distinctions between human and other? Yeah, I will try to humbly answer that question, um, which is enormous. Well, I, I would like first to acknowledge that this idea of personhood um, actually came from New Zealand when, for the first time, uh, the Maori River was recognized as a personhood. And it was um, um, legally, there was two people appointed as protectors of that river. So of course, it's a very human construct because we are <laughs> based on human constructions and ontologies and the language. So the idea of rights of nature and specifically personhood comes maybe from a symbolic uh, gesture to make also humans understand the potential of that change, which of course in uh, advocacy, it is also like a huge change that doesn't come, you know, like <laughs> to, it doesn't uh, arrive today uh, as uh, for example, uh, ecocide, recognizing ecocide. So I met Paul Higgins like five years ago, she was already trying to recognize ecocide for 10 years in the Roman Statute. In the meanwhile, um, she has done a lot of work. She has tried to convince at least three countries to sign that um, appeal. And, you know, and the, it still took like 10 years and nothing has happened. And in the meanwhile, Paul Higgins uh, have passed away and many other people have taken her wonderful and really powerful work like Valérie Cabana, that this summer just managed to bring into the, the French uh, minister that same bill, Ecocide, recognized nationally. So, you know, I think legally, yes, it is very human uh, construct and really anthropocentric, but if we don't respect nature, if we don't respect the ecosystems, of course, we need uh, laws to protect the ecosystems and to protect the communities that live along those ecosystems that are being destroyed. And it comes also from a history of our education. Lawyers don't learn environmental law, don't learn ecocide in school. Because I remember, I think it was a few, uh, two or three years ago, I contacted the University of Ghent, and they haven't heard even what ecocide is. So, you know, the change that we have to do to, you know, to recognize those aspects in law, yes, it's a huge historical change that has to happen. And if this is the first step that we have to do also to support juridical systems, to support humans to do that change, yes, it's an anthropocentric move, but it's an important one because nature is at stake, but we are also at stake. And I don't think these rights, personal rights or rights of nature, are actually to protect rivers. No, it's to protect humans from their own actions. And there is where we can see how anthropocentric it is, of course, because we are out of control. We don't respect the ecosystems. So if we have to think of how law can be implemented, look at now, pandemic. We have a law implemented that we can't do this. We can go out in the streets. So it's like if we don't control what is happening, it's like an auto-destructive uh, path that we are doing as humanity. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps maybe it's not the only solution, but it can be uh, a trigger for that change that will help also juridical systems, but also to prevent that corporations keep on um, destroying uh, the territories because the regulations that are also implemented on them have a relationship with those rights of nature. Can you imagine that we are in 2020 and only one country in the world has the rights of nature in the constitution and even though it's not even applied because Ecuador is also a, a country that lives completely economy from oil. So, you know, it's like everything is upside down and I think it's uh, the role of artists, is the world of um, the teach 
doctors, it's the role of education, it's the role of the activists, the earth keepers, the indigenous people. We are the ones who are always there, you know, to remember us of what needs to be changed. And I think it comes all together. And mm. if, if law is one of the ways to go, I think <laughs> it's an mm. important one too. Yeah, I really appreciate that, um, the honesty of that answer, but also the, the pragmatism um, of using all the tools that we have available to us to achieve what justice we can with what we have um, within our reach as a collective, um, yeah, as a collective, as a society. So I really appreciate that kind of like that pragmatism, that, that honesty in service of and in hopes of something that exceeds and extends beyond that intellectualization, that kind of Western cosmology um, or ontological uh, framework. Um, to pivot a little bit, I'd like to go back to Amanda um, and go a little bit back to in your practice, how, how you see the role of the body and the role of embodiment as uh, a mechanism through which we can do decolonization as opposed to think and talk decolonization? Well, magical thinking happens through identification, right? It is different than rational thinking, which happens through observation, categorization, uh, structuring of reality making making um, sort of distinctions of oppositions and so on and magical thinking i think as as grace mentioned it is very much at the root of art and shamanism and arts and dance right and music <laughs> they do um, they do enact this form of knowing which happens by by empathy by identification by processes we have lost like a lot in the Western and urban context, like dreaming uh, as forms of knowing, uh, trance as forms of knowing. So through the, I think that is a very patriarchal, patriarchal process, right? Because we, th we think about colonial modernity and patriarchy, they happen, they are processes that develop at the same time. And this idea of unveiling the secrets of nature, right? In order to control the non-human non world. Um, it happens through uh, uh, first a uh, system, which was the bell jar, which is a metaphor for, for modern science, right? Isolation from relations. The bell jar is this glass uh, lamp that you place on top of that which you want that you wish to get to know, and then you observe what happens to that object, let's say a plant, an animal, in total isolation. So that form of knowing is not very handy today because we are discovering that actually the, 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 the real situation is that things are much less causal and much more relational, that things are intertwined, no? that there are networks of relations, and, and we are entering in that form, that, that paradigm of knowing that is not so ca causal. So when you isolate in order to know, you disturb all the relations. You create a knowledge through a form of relation which is very it creates a sort of irresponsibility because when you have a distance from that, what you are getting to know, you don't feel it so much, right? You are separated. I think embodied practices are forms of knowing. I don't think dance is a form of expression, for example. I think that's a reduction of its possibilities. And to know uh, through through identification, through no, to know through 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 felt experience creates a very different form of uh, relation and a very different uh, form of responsibility towards that, what you are getting to know. So I have been developing this, something I'm calling uh, practicas ecosomaticas, which has to do with reproducing what the Masewa do in their terms, in lay terms, let's say, and the way I can do it with a group of people outside or inside a theater or in a museum. 
using uh, somatic practices, but also forms of more shamanic uh, uh, practices and, and ex exercises. And what I found, when what I thought is very beautiful, is that people then started to account that <laughs> when they were uh, performing or, or, or yeah, being in the forest, that was clear cut through that dance, yeah, which was a dance, uh, sort of, let's say, uh, yeah, an exercise of embodiment of, you know, and now you have to be a clear cut at the forest. The person who was dancing that uh, that clear cut at the forest could feel that actually the forest was not clear cut, but all the roots were inside and connected still in the in the in the tree stumps down. So that that brought an insight to that person and to the group, right? We were doing this as, as a group because I think that it's interesting that this kind of knowledge emerges and then is shared. It's not a sort of I teach, but actually we can get to learn through this experiment. To this game or to this dance, uh, we understood that we understood the the feeling of the forest, <laughs> of being alive yet cut it on the top, <laughs> which is very different to to information about a forest that you can read. It has a different uh, sense. It it creates another responsibility. It creates another form of relation. So I think this would be my personal answer. I, mm. I do really think that we are missing forms of embodiment and forms of collective action that that are that happen through identification that happen through, through dance and mm. through through practices of, of of being together in 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 ways that can create other forms of worlds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i find that so um evocative and and very it mirrors a lot of what Grace was speaking about in, in using these non-rational methodologies to inspire the possibility of a remembering, um, of a rethinking, um, and a thinking that is an embodied thinking or a knowing that is an embodied knowing, um, and to propose the possibility that this distinction between cognition and body and being is a distinction that is maybe not as self-evident as you may have um, interpreted it into our present society. Go yes, ahead, Amanda. Uh, sorry, and, and actually that, that division, it really comes from, I mean, when we look at the human, oh, we, we, we used to speak about human as something good, now we are human, but we look at the history of the term human, right? And it happens through separation from the animal, let's say the horse, but then through separation from all those who were less than human, which are which are the racialized, the black, the indigenous, yeah. all the others, and their forms of knowing are then minimized, right? Mm. Are, are, are sort of devaluated. Mm -hmm. So dance is one of them. So dancers are, in a way, and I feel a strong solidarity with my compañeros de comunidades indígenas when I work with them on the projects like we do definitely share something which is this form of knowing and this form of relating and this form of understanding relation right mm -hmm. through and through and through processes of identification and of trans mm. yeah thank you for highlighting that specificity and highlighting specifically that um, the technology of movement and dance as a specifically um, reduc reduced form of knowing because of its association with indigeneity, because of its association with blackness, and in some regards because of its uh, association with femininity. Um, and on that kind of line of non-rational methodologies, I want to I go to Grace and to hear a little bit more about um, one of the examples that you used in the Healing the Museum project. You were in a museum and you used meditation as a way to activate or tap into a different kind of frequency um, or invite people to have a different relationship with the objects that they were in space with to propose a different kind of relationality. Um, and you said that there were distinct kind of experiences um, by different people and people who identified differently within that space. I wondered if you could speak more about that and speak more about potentially other 
moments in which you've applied non-rational um, methodologies that have had this effect or this possibility of creating a different relationship and a different relationality, a uh, kind of something more in the line of the strong relationality that Amanda was speaking about? Well, um, I guess I should say that um, for me, the reason why I'm interested in using these methodologies is really to do with the way the left brain and the right brain work. So in, in the sense that the left brain is much more rational um, in its taking in of information. And the right brain is um, perhaps, you could say, more creative. It's more tapped into the bigger picture. Um, it's where the, the shamanic journey and dream work and any kind of healing is connected to the right brain. And so my work is about balancing those two hemispheres and so, for example, in the, um, the project I talked about when it was working with refugees and migrants and then people in agencies like the UN and NATO, um, these are really two, you could say, two polarised groups in terms of, you know, the way that trauma affects them and how to deal with it and the power imbalances. But... Um, the reason why I set it up the way I did that project was uh, firstly by separating the two types of groups. Um, it was about building trust, but also it was to do with this left brain, right brain and what the two groups needed. So, uh, for example, um, the activists and refugees, um, they're living with a sense of being in a survival mode, you know, a sense of being burnt out. So it's really about calming the mind and um, a, a sense of safety. Whereas um, with the people who work in agencies, they have quite a comfortable life in the sense of they have a good physical security and stability. But their issue and their anxiety is by constantly having to tick boxes and to have these make these high pressured decisions that affect thousands or millions of people every day. And so they kind of need um, what I was working with, this idea of creative visualisation. So they understand that they can tap into their right brain to come up with different ways of thinking about these problems. And so, yeah, it was really interesting because one of the people in the, in the agency was on that side, the staff member side, was a, a judge, um, one of the high court judges in Lille, um, he does all the horrible asylum cases. And um, as I got to know him, like understanding how stressful that is, that you decide the future of a person. And he's like the last person you see before you get sent back. You know, he's not the first judge, he's like the last judge. And so it's really his final decision. And so to live with that much stress, and how to deal with it, you know, um, so he can make, um, you know, what he believes to be good, um, sensible decisions. And how that stress, um, it, it's not that the stress can be, um, it's not about comparing traumas, like, oh, I'm more traumatised than you, but it's about healing and thinking about um, having empathy and trying to see the other side of the story. You know, so, you know, obviously the refugee, you know, the ones that I met who have travelled, you know, for months and months, uh, trying to get to Europe, thinking that they'll find some sort of safety and then discovering that Europe actually is a hellhole <laughs> in terms of, like, for their position within society um, and that they haven't necessarily going to be received with warm, open arms and, you know, given liberties and safety and that level of stress. And so, yeah, in my work, I try to, I guess, um, there is this connection to do with racial justice or inequality and um, other issues that come together and coincide. Um, I could say that um, recently I just wrote an essay called The Healing of America. Um, it was commissioned by Philip and um, in Vancouver, it's an art journal. And so the healing of America was actually um, kind of a coda and ending to 2020. And it was about the end of, you know, just after the US election. So about the ramifications of um, 
not just whether if Biden had won or Trump had won a second term or whatever, it was, more, it was much more about the bigger picture of it doesn't really matter who wins. Um, from the left perspective, there's still so much work to be done and how to go about doing that work. And so um, part of my one of my references in the Haney of America was actually to look back at uh, an unrealized performance that I wasn't able to do in the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art in 2018. Um, and that was about looking at uh, um, police killings of unarmed black men. And so um, Utah is quite a Mormon um, city. And so, um, um, and state. And so, um, because of some issues, the, 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 the performance never happened. But that performance was looking at kind of the, the roots of the police killings of unarmed um, black men. It's actually the stuff that's going on now. It's not just because of Trump and his election, it goes all the way back to the Civil War and how those ghosts of the Civil War and you know, the racial injustice from then is still being reenacted now. So how trauma just continues from generation to generation, um, all the way up to, you know, George Floyd. And, um, and so how these complex issues and um, need to be given um, a bigger space. And so I looked at also how um, the, one of the presidential candidates, Marion Williamson, um, she had run um, on a platform, right, an amazing platform about the six pillars for a season of moral repair. And she was like very interested in economic justice, um, justice for children and youth, mass mobilization for climate change. Um, she even thought about having a department of peace and really also about reparations. So the damage to done to historic wrongs. And um, so in the essay, that's also part of it, because um, in my own life, personal life, I had met Marion Williamson um, in 2012 in a conference on spirituality, when I was feeling very disjointed about the art world and feeling, you know, that it was just, you know, very market focused. And so I was, you know, I managed to get some time with her and to discuss my feelings of being wanting to be uh, an artist and being spiritual and politically minded and, she, you know, and talking to her about that and had, she gave me some great advice of what to do and how to keep going. And so really one of the things that really propelled me into kind of quitting um, everything and kind of giving up my apartment, you know, and throwing a lot of stuff away and beginning this kind of nomadic life, which I led for quite a few years and where I kind of made a decision only to go to the um, city when it was necessary. So I would always have, be in nature, I was always going to be in a rural context uh, and only go to the city when it was necessary. And so this understanding for me um, as a black person going into rural places in Europe um, and understanding that as a black body, you're always seen as urbanized. You're never seen as rural, you know. Whereas in um, Africa, uh, most of the population still lives in rural places. So, you know, it, it's really to do with the lens of like where you are on this uh, situation, whether you're seen as rural or urban. But I'm just talking about this um, to kind of um, bring back um, the connection in my own practice mm -hmm. about how these environmental issues or this um, wanting to work more in nature and in the rural context and how that is connected to my other work mm -hmm. around uh, black healing and racial justice. Mm -hmm. So, if, yeah, people can read this um, article uh, mm -hmm. called The Healing of America. It's online. So. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And for those who are interested in reading, you can find that essay, if I understand well, at the site of Grace and Diritu. You can just Google Grace and Diritu and the, the website should come up. Or you can go to the site of uh, Voretz and you can click on the link with the Grace's name and you'll be able to find all of that information there. Thank you so much for sharing, Grace. As we are coming to the end of our time together, I wanted to hear from each of you 
in 2021, after this era-defining year that we have come from 2020 with the um, coronavirus pandemic that completely shifted our paradigms um, as, a, as a kind of global community, um, I wondered for you in 2021, what is the one thing that you are hoping to see or hoping to generate um, throughout this year relating to environmental justice, social justice, whether it be on a macro level, on a big scale, or whether it be you on a micro level in your individual life or practice, what is the one thing that you would like to see come about this year? Starting with you, Maria Lucia. Well, I can speak in behalf of myself in the sense that I I think it is important to keep the work uh, that um, I have been researching, which is the, the idea of um, guardianship and stewardship, uh, no matter what that territory is, because I think that role is quite important to evolve to something that is more close to cosmology and renewal. But also, I hope <laughs> that we are able to see each other again <laughs> live <laughs> and that we can have shared spaces, we can kiss each other again, we can hug, we can practice a lot of different forms of artistic expressions together, we can put all our words into practice. And um, yeah, to, to hope that this virus, it's a lesson that is teaching us but also a transformative process that can decolonize our minds and slow down and uh, rethink our practices as artists as well. Um, and to embody what we mean when we speak and to do it how mm -hmm. you believe and how you want the things to be changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Maria Lucia. Same question to you, Grace. One thing in the year of 2021 that you want to see one thing, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interpret guess, as you will. I guess it's um, something that connects, I guess, my own practice and this interest in healing in political spheres. And um, so, for example, with the left, I really feel that the left needs to come together and not be um, divisive. For example, in, the, in America with the election of Biden, that... I feel like actually, yes, Biden's not perfect, Kamala's not perfect, but if 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 the left doesn't, you know, work on its own um, ghosts and its own anti-racism and its own, you know, its own thinking around certain subjects and um, its own problems, that and and it, and, it, and it divides again, let's say that we could have an era of Trump-style politics again. And we really want to avoid this kind of thing. Um, so this chance to, like, of healing, like, on a minute scale, but also on a bigger scale, of understanding that the left really has to work on itself and not just, you know, be polarising and, you know, blame the right and blah, 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 blah. You know, the right's going to do whatever it's going to do, but the left really has to work on its own... Um, its own personal uh, issues and its own, um, you know, look in the mirror, mm -hmm. and um, and therefore um, then it will give a bigger chance to deal with, you know, these issues of racial injustice and environmental justice. Mm -hmm. You know, so that that's what I would say: a healing for the left. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, twenty twenty one will be the year of healing of the left. <laughs> And the same question finally to you, Amanda. One thing that you're hoping to see in the year of 2021? Well, I would very much like to see institutions, like art institutions and art funding institutions understand the fact that we only can have this, I mean, first, through climate change, everything is related. What happens in glaciers in Chile or I don't know where, it affects the whole, right? If that is the case, which we see that it is, why do art has to happen only in Europe, 
if funded by Europe? And why not institutions from Europe, which are which is like one of the few places in the world that you can live out of art, yeah? Because in other places, for example, in Latin America, you do many other things in order to, to do art and you have less time to do it, of course. Uh, and it's very, very challenging. Uh, in the places of extraction, why not to fund projects in the places of extraction and not always in these uh, centers and, and cities and, and how to propose uh, projects like that, you know, that happens in the places of extraction that have to do with making, creating awareness of, 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 of the whole situation and, and working with communities and with activists. Uh, because I, I really, like, in my case, like, I, I work in art in Europe that allows me to do other things in other places, which, you know, which are funded by that. But I, I wonder, like, what is, what is really planetary cult culture, right? And what it means for it to really have um, an, an, an understanding of planetary culture and, and, and the interconnectedness. Because it's very funny, you know, like in this particular place in, in Chile where, where I come from, I learned uh, the extraction of all those minerals goes directly into the uh, Bellic European industry, into weapons. So, so, you know, why not can be the other way, you know? Why mm. cannot be interesting educational projects and artistic projects that don't happen like a charity, but happen like culture and art. This is what I would like to see, of mm. course. It's, it's a vision, but I, I do think we cannot, we have to start thinking about culture, art, Education, etc., not 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 anymore from a from a national perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a reparative. Yeah, a reparative kind of cultural, cross national. Yeah, yeah definitely. I I heartily agree <laughs> with that. Um, and on that note, I want to thank you so much for all that you have offered uh, all three of you tonight so generously from your hearts, from your minds, from your practices, so rigorously. Um, and I want to give a thank you to our audience for joining us for this evening of discussions. And of course, a huge thank you to our speakers, Amanda, Maria Lucia, and Grace, uh, the support team here at Vred, working behind the scenes, um, who made this evening, or assist in making this evening possible our partners who assist us in making these conversations, and most especially you, our audience at home, for tuning in and supporting the, the work we do with your attention. And so I want to wish you all speakers, people working behind the scene, and our audience, I want to wish you a fine evening. And I wish us all the courage of conviction in 2021 to do what we can, where we are, with what we have, in service of justice and liberation for all beings on this earth that we share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.